the name of this is called the new um, parentheses Black America. What the hell is new? <laughs> Everything old is new. And so when you when you hear that, is is should we be saying as opposed to trying to create something new, trying to come up with uh, this sort of new paradigm, is it a question of saying no? Do what we used to do, moving forward. Yeah, I, I don't. You know, I don't think the the focus should be on quote creating a new Black America. The the we have to look inward at ourselves and decide what are we prepared to focus on that we can fix amongst ourselves, as opposed to looking for someone else to try to fix the problems for us. And the reality is is that we have become dependent upon looking for the government to solve challenges. This is really not complicated, folks. We have the wealth within our own community if we would simply start to invest in our own businesses and do business with ourselves. Um, we focus on at Black Enterprise, our mantra is wealth for life. The biggest gaps we have in this country is not the education divide, it's not the digital divide, it's not the, you know, the insurance divide, what have you, it's the wealth divide. If you, in fact, have wealth, all of those other things you have. And we have that wealth within our own community if we're prepared to invest back in our own businesses. But as I, as I speak to groups all across the country all the time, I say to them, let's look at other communities. In the Jewish community, the dollar turns over six times before it ever leaves. In the African-American community, it doesn't turn over even half meaning by the time it lands, we're spending it somewhere else. So stop looking at, we gotta create programs and other things, and this is a complicated thing, it is not. You need to decide, I'm going to take my money that I've earned, I'm going to find the black auto dealer, I'm going to find the black dry cleaner, I'm gonna find the black investment banker, I'm gonna find the black whatever it might be, and I'm gonna put my money in with them. That's not isolating us, that's, that's protecting ourselves and that is reinvesting in ourselves, that's what has to happen. So it's not a new plan, it is taking the plan and, and, and doing something with it. And Tom, and the reality is that their government does serve a role, private serves a role. Look, uh, 1973, Maynard Jackson becomes mayor of Atlanta. At that time, African Americans were receiving 0.0012% of all city contracts. Maynard Jackson comes into Atlanta, Coleman Young in Detroit, Marion Barry comes in DC. You have this group of black mayors who made it clear that they were going to open up those doors of opportunity for black businesses. And that's how, when you look at the skyline of this city, Russell right. Construction, huge, huge part of that. And so, that, but that's maximizing politics, but you still have to also deal with black owned businesses also being able to uh, get capacity. Right. First of all, you've got to understand that civic engagement is important because we could not have gotten a Maynard Jackson, a Coleman Young and those in office if our community didn't turn out. Sadly, we only had 23 percent of the eligible voters in this city to turn out in last mayor's election. But the important thing about their leadership, uh, Maynard Jackson said to us, it doesn't matter whether your name is first, second or third on the sign outside the door. It's a joint venture, work together. So you got black people to understand, bringing your resources together, you can get a bigger piece of the pie. The other thing was he took on the corporate community here and said to them, we won't build a new airport until you commit to following my suggestion and lead of 25% of the procurement. We're at the time, we're over 70% of the city's population. It's amazing that today we still have the program started on the late Maynard Jackson here. We're doing 37% mandated requirement in this city. No other city in this country does that. When we expanded the, the airport with the last 5.3 billion expansion, 1.6 billion of that went to mostly black owned businesses in this city. And so we've had that kind of leadership. But back to what Butch was saying, it's still important for us in our community to understand that nobody's gonna give us anything, that we earned it, the government takes taxes from it, it's our money, we should not be begging for that money, but the other important part is nobody should expect that they're gonna get a free meal. 
You got to be good at what you do. You got to be best. But we have to work together. I've been in business 24 years. My biggest challenges have come from black elected officials and black folks who, as I say always, black people, you know, understand there are those of our color who are not of our kind. And there are those of our kind who are not of our color. But we have to still understand it's on us to do our job. Butch, uh, we've seen about a $700,000 addition of black-owned businesses in the past five years or so. We went from 1.9 million to 2.6 million. But when there were 1.9 million, 1.8 million only had one employee. Of the 2.6 million, 2.5 million only had one employee. We've even seen a decrease, though, where when we had 1.9 million black-owned businesses, they averaged revenue, annual revenue was 110,000. Now it's 78,000. So we have more black-owned businesses, right. but their annual revenue has decreased. Uh, and so Black Enterprise obviously focuses on that. Uh, what is required to be to again building capacity? People say we need more black owned businesses. I say no, we need more with capacity. Yeah, so the, the biggest challenge 96% of black owned businesses today are sole proprietorships, which means in effect all you do is employ yourself. And, and so there's, there's, there's a politically correct answer and there's the real answer. <laughs> Okay, well, I want I'm the a, damn real answer. Right, but I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you the real <laughs> yes, answer. Yes, yes. The fact of the matter is the biggest challenge for African American business today is not access to capital. And let me say that again. It is not access to capital. The biggest challenge for African American businesses today is scale. So what happens is is that I we've got a series of clients. We'll put on an entrepreneur summit. We'll have 30 corporate clients who will come who are begging to come and do business with uh, minority-owned businesses. And some of them have come up to me and said, listen, I got three small contracts. Can you put me in touch with who I can, I'm going to give this contract directly to this business. Well, here's a heads up. You cannot be doing sales of a half million dollars and bid on a $10 million contract. So what's a small contract in, the, in corporate America, may, which maybe Walmart was one of our examples. They had three contracts. He said, I got a, apologizing to me. I got a $50 million contract apologizing, a $200 million contract and a $750 million contract. I said, do you know that overnight that the, the lowest of the contracts puts them in the BE 100s? I said, it can't operate that way. But what we have, and this is the going to what is the real problem, we have to bury our egos and combine our businesses. If, if Delta and Northwest can get together and J.P. Morgan and Chase get together, why can't Pookie and Ray Ray get together? Right? The, the, notion of, the notion that somehow or another, I need to have a gold-plated business card that says I'm president, CEO, chairman, what have you, of nothing, of a business that makes $100,000, you can't deposit business card. It may be great in the nightclub to show someone you've got, you're the chairman, CEO, but it doesn't mean it. You can't deposit it to It's anything. interesting, Tommy, because I mean, I've spoken at multiple, <laughs> go ahead. Well, no, I mean, so, go ahead. so the reality is if you come into a city and there's three black owned businesses that do the same exact thing that make cups and they're each doing a hundred, you ask yourself this question. Right. Would you rather own a hundred percent of a company that generates $200,000 or would you rather own 20% of a company that generates $20 million? <laughs> it's really simple arithmetic. Well, but if our ego is such, but I got to say to people that I'm the, I'm the man, I'm the boss, then you're going to be the boss of nothing. And, and, and Tommy, I've seen organizations that also don't drive that. In fact, I mean, I, I mean I've keynoted multiple right. black chambers of commerce events all across the country. And when they bring me in to do the keynote, I, I said, I want to see the program. And so when I look at the program, I go through the whole program and look at the workshop stuff along those lines. And I would say in every instance, and I would say this in a speech and then the person over it would be mad as hell when I'm done, I would say, how is M&A, mergers and acquisitions, not a part of this conference? Right. And I, I spoke at an event in Houston, it was very interesting. So they gave, they had these awards, so they gave three awards to three PR companies. And to your point, I'm sitting there waiting to speak and I'm going, why in the hell there are three small PR companies <laughs> and those three don't sit down to say, what if we create one major black owned PR company right. to go after the larger business? And so that, that, that barrier is there. 
How do we get leadership to understand they have to teach folks right. M&A? Well, you, you look at this city, I have to give kudos to um, Bill Picard and his group. They bought up Atlanta Daily World and Atlanta Tribune, and they've combined that under one umbrella. Um, yeah, I don't get seven black newspapers in one city. Yeah, which it makes is crazy. no sense to me. Which is crazy. So we're beginning consolidation there. Just this week, we opened Unity Bank, a national bank here in Atlanta. We started in Houston. Go Case, ahead, I'm sorry. Case Lawal, who's a billionaire, African, is a um, African bil billionaire who started Fort Valley State, finished at Texas Southern. Uh, he's chairman of the board. They're trying now to consolidate more banks. There were over 87. Now we're down to 20 black banks. And the case there, which gets us to where we are, they can't do major loans, or can't even take major instruments. I had 24 million from one of my organizations I wanted to put into a black bank. They couldn't handle the 24 million because they didn't have all the instruments. We have a quarter of a billion dollar retirement fund. I chair the Fulton Cap Hospital Authority <coughs> that owns Grady's Health System. My board has mandated that a minimum of 20% has to go to African-American and minority-owned businesses. I can't put that money into any of the banks here because we have to grow them. And then finally, the important part for us, as, as we've said, the egos have to be left at the door. And we have to work hand-in-hand hand with the 100 black men of America. What we've done is we have a mandate to do business <coughs> with black uh, with our black community and entrepreneurs. Atlanta Business League did the 5% solution, but still at the end of the day, businesses are not giving us the opportunity, <coughs> many of them, to be able to invest and use their services because they haven't grown to scale or capacity. That was one of the great things that the late Maynard Jackson did when he brought up businesses in, it worked. But unfortunately today, <coughs> Today, everybody wants to compete as opposed to come together. We had Wall Street, we had Black Wall Street in Raleigh Durham. We had Sweet Auburn here. We had Bill Street and others. And it worked because businesses work together. We don't need something new. That's something old that works today if we just employ it and, and begin to use it together. You today. talked about 20, you talked about 20 uh, black owned banks. And one of the things that, that, that I always study, I, 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 as, a, as a person who's in media, um, um, I like to be able to connect historical realities in terms of what's happening if we're talking about politics or anything else. Right. And what we're facing 25 years away from 2043 when we become a majority minority country is that the three pillars in the black community are literally crumbling. For one, you mentioned black banks, so your financial institutions. You look at uh, what's happening with HBCUs, which Tommy, you know very well. <coughs> But then the third one, Butch, is black media. And so when you talk about black newspapers, magazines, uh, look, I had the only, the, the only daily television show on a black network, which uh, was canceled and last day was December 21st. And so now, where do we get our information from on a daily basis? And so if you have your three pillars, finance, education, and media, that's facing a difficult situation. Uh, what is your fear as we go towards 2043 when we'll have numbers, but not necessarily have power and influence? Well, not, and, and we may have numbers, but let's not get away from the fact we're trying to address the issue of over incarceration of black males right now. And so people are strategically preparing to make sure we don't have the power come later and we're giving them the power to make those decisions when you look at black and brown young men being locked up and locked away and never should be so that's one way that they're going to deal with it but the late mayor jackson and i love him he was a phenomenal genius said that we'll get ahead with the ballot the buck and the book the three b's the three b's which his grandfather taught him right definitely and so when we look at today in the media to spread the word i mean social media can give you lies and can give you truth. And unfortunately, too many of our folks depend on social media. And some of it's good and a lot of it's mess. But when we look at what we have to do, I have dedicated my, myself to HBCUs. Folks can say whatever they want about these great institutions. I have five children, all five went to HBCUs. I put my money where my mouth is. 
But today, we're down to 103. Uh, in the early 1930s, we had 235, and there's no excuse. When Mary McLeod Bethune could start Bethune Cookman with $7, and today we are billionaires and multimillionaires, and we don't put our money in. If you don't want to send your children to our institutions, that's fine, but send your money and support them, because it'll come a day we won't be able to go there. But <clears throat> building off of what you said even in, with HBCUs, Again, these are self-inflicted, much of this self-inflicted. Of HBCU graduates, 7% of them contribute back to their own HBCUs. Mm -hmm. I have friends who I went to business school with at an Ivy League school who went to an HBCU who would rather give money to Wharton Business School than they would back to Florida A&M. There's something wrong with that. And that's not someone doing that to us. That is a self-inflicted, self-hate, if you will, to some degree, to say, I'm not going to go back to the institutions. Now, my father, <clears throat> Morgan State, uh, who, who um, you know, thank God, is still alive, but he is completely dedicated to Morgan State. Right. Right? He spells college Morgan State. <laughs> he believes, because he said there was no other place that was going to give him an opportunity. Right. So... His first chance, he gave a million dollars to the school and said, we're going to build out, and they, build a, they built a business school around him, and he's been spending his time now trying to raise money for it. But Morgan State is actually in a better position because it's a state school. Precisely. So as a state school, it still gets some state money. The schools that are private, yeah. HBCUs, are in a world of trouble. Right. And then <clears throat> we, we do a, an entire HBCU summit, and we, we do a thing on Tech Connect. Many of them in 2018 do not have a curriculum that deals with technology as we speak. How can you ha in 2018 have a curriculum that is more focused on African American studies than is focused on technology? That's just not where the jobs are. So with all due respect, again, these are self-inflicted things. We have to make the hard decision, look within ourselves and say, what is it that we can do to make these respective changes. I believe in, I believe in case studies. And so um, if we talk about M&A, we talk about whether or not those particular HBCUs. Um, give me a couple examples both. Who is doing it right? Where, where, where if you say, look, go look at this, go talk to this person. They're doing it right. Study what they're doing. North Carolina a &T. Would be my first. Right. Would be my so, first. No, no, no. But give, no, but give, give me a private HBCU. Because they're HBCU. also a public HBCU. Well, I, so, so give me HBCU or business. Somebody you know who's do, who's doing it right. Who, who who you can say go study that, replicate that. I, I think from a business perspective, I'll, I'll go. I'll talk to the business thing perspective. Although I will I will give North Carolina A and T this. In our Tech Connect Summit, where we've had a hackathon where we bring in the competition together. And last year we had 15 schools, this year we'll have 20. They've won each of the last two years. And they've won because they have an active program teaching these kids. And, and the reason I put together the Tech Connect Summit in the first place is because I had all these clients of mine in Silicon Valley saying, I'm searching, I'm searching, I can't seem to find any black people to hire. <laughs> and I said, where are you looking? I said, if you're only looking at Cal, Berkeley, and Stanford, you're not going to find them. I said, if you're having difficulty finding, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring them to you so you, don't can't, you no longer have to look. <laughs> so we brought the schools to Silicon Valley, which is where we have the event, and every one of those kids got job offers. In fact, the kids from North Carolina A&T, the one brother in particular, got 12 different job offers from every possible company you could think of. So if I could give one piece of advice to you about your kids and your grandchildren, focus them on technology. Digital and technology, that is an, a, a, a lim an unlimited opportunity. And, and, and for you answer, Tommy, that doesn't mean they necessarily would be a scientist or be no. uh, a coder, but it's, I mean, look, in, in the business that I'm in, we use technology. We literally are live streaming this event to multiple platforms at the exact same time uh, as opposed to saying, well, you know what, we're just going to re record it and shoot it later. So even in media, if you don't understand technology, you'll be left behind. 80% of the jobs in technology are non-STEM, are non-engineering related jobs. 80% of them. So stop the madness if I don't know coding that I can't do. There's no company today 
that has not been impacted upon te by technology. Right. None. Everyone has been disrupted by technology. The media business. Yes. Right. We Black Enterprise was a magazine. You know, I have four millennial, not children, but four millennial <laughs> young adults at this point. I can't quite understand them. When I say I can't quite understand them, because I'll call them, they'll text me back. <laughs> right? There's just no, so they, they prefer to communicate in a completely different way. Well, part of that is they don't want to read the hard copies of a magazine. Right. That's a, re, that's a reality of the business that we're in. So we've had to adjust our own right. business to become a digital business, event business. The, the, the magazine portion of our business is the, is the, is the right. least profitable of the four elements of how we deliver yeah. content. I mean, Essence Festival makes more money for Essence than the actual magazine. Much more, 80% of it. Right, no, I mean, they, I mean right. that's just the reality. Tom. Let, let, let's deal, even right here in Atlanta, Spelman, Morehouse, Clark Atlanta University are still very strong private institutions. Most people don't realize some of the greatest prostate cancer research, not just in here but in this country, is done at Clark Atlanta University. We have one of the best in the nation, and we have over nine patents that have been developed. You still look at Morehouse and the things that are happening there and the folks who are going into multiple areas, even with STEM and everything in Spelman, has been tops in this nation for so many years. That's just here in Atlanta. So we can go through those, but then let's not forget that Morehouse School of Medicine and Meharry and, and Howard School of Medicine are still in the area, still producing over 70% over of all black doctors in this nation, and you could go by discipline and find that all of the various institutions have something to offer, but it still boils down mm -hmm. to lack of resources and our community not investing back in, into those institutions. And so it's on us, but curriculum, why aren't the African Americans who graduated from these institutions or who didn't in corporate America coming back helping to design programs? At Florida a m University, I'm a trustee there. We have folks now coming back working with us in multiple areas. We've gotten over some challenges. Right. People want to condemn a great university over one incident, but when you look at our school of pharmacy, law school and all, we're moving there. So, so the bottom line is we still have to reinvest and invest and make them what they ought to be and not leave them on the sideline because when they're gone, our kids, right. our young people, aren't going to have access to higher education. And, and that right there, and then we've got a, a, a little time left, that is exactly it. The point that I keep making is, especially in media, we will rue the day when we are asking somebody else to tell our story. When it comes to our schools, we'll rue the day when we're asking somebody else can, can we, you please educate our children? And financially, if we do not have those institutions, who are we looking to, to invest? What do you want, last question to both of you, what do you want folks, this is where the challenge comes in, what do you want the folks in this room, the folks who are watching uh, on st streams and various platforms, what do you want them to do tomorrow when they leave here and this is over? There's a, uh, I appreciate that question and, and it's, we need to stop focusing on, on the, what the problem is and the woe is we and what the solution is. So I would offer up two things. One is, is that we have to hold, and I know this is big for you, we have to hold people accountable. That's right. Okay? You have to hold people accountable. People and institutions. Right. And when I say hold people accountable, meaning this. If you're a senior executive in corporate America and all you're worried about is yourself and not those that are behind you that need the opportunity to be brought up, you are in fact a, a worse than having a racist sitting in that position. Because in many ways what you've done is you're blocking up and you're providing license to the people who are around you who may not look like you to say, well, if he's able to, or she is able to keep people back, I certainly have no reason not to. <clears throat> so hold those people accountable. When you, the door is opened, you got there not because you're the smartest person in the room, because someone else um, died for the benefit of you being in that position, and you have a responsibility to make sure that you're holding up and bring up the next group. Second is for those who are sitting on corporate boards. And my father told me this a long time ago when I first got onto a corporate board. He said, Butch, do not get confused. They did not run out of smart white people to put on boards. They put your black behind on this board for you to advocate on behalf of other people that look just like you. And if you're not gonna do that, then get, don't ever join a board. And that is, Responsibility. So if I challenge people who are sitting in this audience to say, if you're sitting in your corporate seat 
and you're the vice president, don't be so happy that you're sitting in his corporate seat as the vice president. You can be replaced like that. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, you need to make sure you're advocating every day when you wake up for what black owned business, what black person could I help to bring up and make sure they get promoted to do. And for those of you who are fortunate enough to ever sit on a corporate board, if you're not challenging management and not challenging those other board members to make sure we're getting contracts, shame on you. You have that responsibility. Tommy Dorch. All right, real quick. I want everyone in here to commit themselves to at least give a minimal one hour a week to a young male or young female in your community. We need to mentor them. Young people aren't born bad. They learn bad behaviors from adults. And we can't sit and continue to watch our young future leaders in the future of this nation to be locked up and locked away because they made a simple mistake. And we try to do that in the 101. Start getting involved in the life of a young person. We have a mentoring program that leads to entrepreneurship, thanks to Wells Fargo, our, our, our pathways to success. We gotta grow new entrepreneurs. The other thing that's important, uh, when Unity Bank opened, I opened a bank account at Unity Bank. I have a bank account at Citizen Trust Bank. We need to invest in our own communities. And last but not least, HBCUs. I have five scholarship uh, at five HBCUs. I have five uh, honorary doctor's degrees uh, in addition to that, but I put my money into these institutions and we need to invest. So quit worrying and complaining about what others aren't doing and start doing it ourselves. Do business with our businesses. And if they aren't doing right, hold them accountable. Talk to them. I tell my folks, if I go to a Chick-fil-A or a McDonald's in Buckhead, then I expect the same service in Bankhead in Atlanta. And so if we don't speak up and speak out, our businesses can't get better. But we don't do that to white-owned businesses. They mistreat us. We go right back. When our black businesses, we have a bad experience. We say we're not going back. We got to work together. That's my only formula. Final comment. <clears throat> um, a lot of people here may be thinking, well, this is what Operation Hope should be doing. The reality is, uh, when you leave here, what is it that you are going to actually do? This conference should actually serve as your personal uh, annual report. What I mean by that is, when you come back next year, you should ask yourself before the first day, what did I do in the last 364 days when it came to the issues that we brought up? If you make a commitment today, what are you going to do beginning tomorrow? you should be able to come back next year and say, this is what I personally accomplished in the last year. If you come back next year and you go, dang, I committed to do this, I got busy, and this is what happened, you're the damn problem. Because it, you can't make a commitment and then not follow through with the commitment and then say, I wonder why nothing has changed. This is not, a, this is not only John's job. This is not only the job of Operation Hope staff. It's not only Tommy's job or Butch's job. It's every single person's job in this room. If people do not act as a, as a collective, then all of the stuff we've talked about the last three days has been a complete waste of time. And for me, I do not waste my time. We have, we, everybody must learn to do their part. Butch Graves Jr., Tommy Dorch. Thanks a lot. <laughs>